<laughs> Anyone see my shovels? You see my shovels today? Different kinds of shovels. I got some snow shovels for clearing the path, and this other one for for digging a hole. But these are these are a little bit about what I'll talk about today. And if I was to title the message today, I think I titled it "Hidden Treasure." Is that what I put up? Hidden Treasure. And I, as I give you this title, "Hidden Treasure," it probably provokes several things in your mind. And who would have thought talking about pirates at Christmas? R. Someone say R. There you go. I thought about buried treasure. I thought about things that are hidden. I thought about secrets. Secret Santa. I thought about secret compartments in cars. There was a guy in the news this week about secret compartments in his cars. (laughs) Best kept secrets. Ever heard that expression? I don't want Pathway to be the best kept secret of Shorewood. Giving in secret. Matthew 6, 3 says, But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Last week we talked a little bit about being led by the Lord to maybe just put some money in an envelope and randomly give it to someone when the Lord speaks on you and just say, someone gave this to me and said it was for you. And it just says, from Jesus on the envelope. Give in secret, maybe. God is asking you to do something like that. Or in the very next verse, to pray in secret, Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your father who sees in secret will reward you. See, this message just started with thinking about hidden things and secret things. And I'm going to take you on a journey of where my study led me rather than, oh, here's a bullet point sermon. Because I like doing those. But this one was just a little bit more of a journey that started with the hidden things. But what occurred to me as I read that verse was the father is in the secret. He's in the secret place and that we need to meet with him in the secret place. Yes, there are rewards for meeting with him and giving in secret, but he sees you in the secret, both good and bad. You see, Santa is not the only one who knows if you've been bad or good. He sees you when you rise and when you fall, when you're awake, and when you are sleeping. So be good, for goodness sake. Hidden things. Hidden things. I heard of a tradition during the Jewish Sadar, their meal at Passover, that one thing that they commonly do is that they take a piece of of the bread and they hide it. And it's a little game for the children to go and find this hidden piece of bread. And until that piece of bread is found, the meal cannot be partaken of by the entire family. Hidden things. There was a number of years that me and Charity got to go down to Mexico at the New Year, right at the start of the New Year, and they celebrate Three Kings Day down there on the 6th of January, every year. And they have this custom called Rosca de Reyes. Anyone ever heard of that before? It's quite incredible. They have this this long, long piece of bread. I think it's braided, if I remember correct. It's a sweet bread, and they eat it with hot chocolate. But inside of this bread, they hide a little porcelain or plastic baby Jesus inside of the bread. Yeah, choking hazard. It would never work here. It's terrible. But the idea is that somebody is going to find this baby Jesus, and it was a symbol of be having a blessed year, and the next round of drinks was on you. 
because you were going to have a blessed year. Hidden things. But it was really symbolizing and reminding that the three kings found Jesus. In this sermon series, the whole thing of a gift for the king started with thinking about the gifts that the king, the wise men brought to baby Jesus. Today we're going to spend most of our time in Matthew chapter 25, so you can turn there. Last week we talked about New Testament giving, which ultimately is generosity. We talked about Linus's blanket. Remember Linus's blanket? And, uh, and when Linus in the peanut story was talking about the meaning for Christmas, he dropped his blanket, and he never drops his blanket, but he drops his blanket when he said, anyone remember? Fear not. And the blanket kind of represents his provision, his security blanket, his comfort, the thing he relied on. But as we look at biblical New Testament generosity, it requires us to fear not and share our comfort blanket with others. And he replaces this comfort with a different sort of comforter. The Holy Spirit is our comforter while we wait for his return. So are you in Matthew chapter 25? So I want to start in verses 33, I shared this verse last week also, and it was where Jesus was talking about how when the kingdom comes, he'll place the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left, and he talked about how I was in need and you cared for me, and then in verse 37, they said, Lord, when did we feed you or show you hospitality? When did we clothe you? When did we visit you when you were in jail? And then verse 40, and the king says, I tell you the truth, when you did it for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you were doing it for me. Someone say context. Whenever you read scripture and it doesn't make sense, look at the context. What that means is look what came after it and look what came before it. Context, context, context is what my biblical teachers at Bible college used to teach. Say context, context, context. What does this mean? Look at the context. So we're going to back this up a little bit to verse 14. And we find the parable of the servants. And I had a feeling that I was going to go to this parable at some point during this series because it talks about gifts. Little did I know how my thoughts on this would change. But in verse 14, Jesus says, again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a man going on a long trip. He called together his servants and entrusted them with his money to them while he was gone. So I'm going to read some and just comment as I go through. Knowing that Jesus was describing his servants, and sometimes it translates as his slaves. They had been entrusted with a huge amount of cash so that they could invest it. Understanding just how generous this master was being, this was an opportunity for each of these servants. It was just an absolutely huge honor. I mean, just think about it for a second. A slave being entrusted with a huge amount of cash He gave five bags of silver or talents throughout this story just to let you know a talent is equal to about a hundred pounds or 45 kilograms of silver he gave one to one bag sorry he gave five bags of silver to one two bags of silver to another one bag of silver to the last dividing it in proportion to their abilities And then he left on his trip. He knew what they were capable of. So he gave them what they were capable of handling. And although at first it may seem 
that the one who received five times as much as the last is receiving so much more. You know, the guy that only had one, he didn't really have a chance if you know how this story ends. But just to put this in perspective, a talent is really more about a measurement of value than it is our gifts and our talents. And often when I've heard this message preached before, naturally our mind goes to what the English translation dictates. When I hear, oh, it was given a talent. Oh, well, some people have lots of talents like Caleb. He can play just about everything and anything, right? Incredibly talented. And other people struggle. Like, I have two left feet. I used to be able to dance, but my brain is only capable of holding so much information, and as I learn new things, I forget the old things. I speak one and a half languages. They taught me French when I was 11 in school. They taught me German when I was 12, and I forgot the French. I moved to the Czech Republic and started learning Czech, and I forgot the German. Lo and behold, I married a German. <laughs> my brain can only hold so much information. A talent was equal to about 6,000 denarii. A denar since one denarii, a denarii is common labor of daily wages, a talent could be roughly the equivalent of 20 years' worth of wages. So even the guy who received the smallest amount, whatever a year's wage is, I don't know what the average is, 30, 40, 50,000 dollars? 52 is the average, so that's what the, the guy who got the least got. He got a significant amount of money. I mean, this is a slave who had really had nothing, and all of a sudden he had a year's worth of wages entrusted to him. Significant amount of money for one denarii. So five talents is the largest amount entrusted to servants, comparable to, I guess, a hundred, no, sorry, 20 years' wages was the smallest, and the largest was a hundred years' worth of wages. Significant amount of money. Anyway, verse 16. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money and earned five more. The servant had two bags, also went, and he earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag went and dug a hole. <laughs> in the ground and hid the master's money. Don't think he was lazy, because it was work to dig the hole. He actually did something. In fact, sometimes when you invest, you're actually just entrusting someone else, and they're doing the work, and then you get a return. But he actually went and did work, interestingly enough. That, that stuck out to me. Sometimes we labor in vain. So although it may seem odd to our audience today, the concept of buried treasure was quite common in those days. Verse 19, after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give account of how they had used his money. The servant whom he had entrusted with the five bags of silver came forward with five more and said, Master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest, and I have earned five more. The master was awful. I like this word. It actually says he was full of praise. But um, when I challenge you, when someone says, how was your day, just say awful. Not awesome. Because we don't have some all. We should be full of all. God is awful. He's full of all. He's not just awesome. He's not full of some all. He's awful. <laughs> so <laughs> the master was... It'll sink in. If you didn't get it, ask someone after, after service. <laughs> How was your day? Awful. Um, the master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling a small amounts. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. This is the equivalent of if I give some sort of if I give cardboard to my son, scissors and a tape, he will go away and a few hours later will come back to me and say, look what I made. And he's created a car out of this or some other amazing creation. But there's this, when the 
servant comes back to the master and says, look what I did with what you gave me and turned it into something even more amazing. And the master is full of awe. Let's celebrate. And the child who had received, sorry, child, the servant who had received two bags of silver came to forth his master. Master, you gave me two. I invested it, and here's two more. This time he's not full of praise. But he does say, well done, and he's my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in handling the small amounts, so I will give you more responsibility. So let's celebrate together. When someone looks at you and says, I think you, you're capable of some more responsibilities, do you go, yay, or do you run away? <laughs> There's something special about these servants that once they've grasped the joy of taking whatever the master gave, and as they used it and saw the return on it, they were excited. And this, I think, is the message that I want to try and get across that I think you see as each of the people get up here to share their gifts, whether it's singing, photography, signing. There's something that's taking place in them. There's something that takes place in me every time I get up to minister. As much as I do this for you guys, the process that God takes me through, he's doing something inside of me. I remember the first time I went on a short-term mission trip. As amazing as it was to see what happened in the people that I got to minister to, God did something inside of me that made me want to do it more. There's a joy inside of you when you are used by God. So this extra responsibility for the person who didn't really want to invest in the first place is I'm, not, I'm good, not my job. But for the one who does it with the heart and gets that return themselves, it's time to celebrate, and there's an excitement about it. Verse 24, the servant who had one bag came to the master and said, Master, I knew you were a harsh man, investing crops that you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate, so I was afraid. I was afraid I would lose your money, or I was afraid I'd lose your talent or your gift, so I hid it in the earth. Look here, your money, look here is your money bag. But there's some translations that yours might say that says, it doesn't say look here is your money, it says look there. You have what is yours. Just curious, how many of you have a translation that says look there? How many people says, look here? Mine's italicized, which means it's not really clear. But I like to think that this man didn't actually even bring the bag when he heard the master had come. He's like, it's, it's out in the field. It's there. Look there. It's still there. It's safe. <laughs> but the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant, if you knew, if you knew that I harvested crops and I, that I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. He's basically saying, you really don't know me that well. He's not saying that he is that type of master who does that. He says, but that's what you're You thought that of me. You thought that I was some kind of evil master. At my coming, that I should have received my own usury, is what some translations say. Now, a usury is the, where we get this word interest. Clearly, you didn't know that this master was Jewish, because Leviticus 25, 36 prohibits Jews from charging interest from other Jews. So you think that I'm an evil master who collects where I didn't sow and I'm going to charge interest. You really didn't know me. But if you really did think of that, then you should have done at least this. But the, the reason for it was that if you live in fear, it will be with unprofitable results. The 
whole purpose of Christmas is to fear not. Take your comfort blanket, lay it before the king, and trust in him. So often we're so focused on the things that are beyond our control. We start focusing and concerning about things that we cannot influence. And suddenly, the things that we used to be able to influence, we can't even control those anymore because we're so caught up with things that are outside of our influence and we're so focused on the things that we're concerned with. He did not invest because he was afraid, so fear not. Verse 28, then he ordered, take the money from this servant. This line said something a little bit different to me when I thought about it in context of the fact that the servant possibly didn't have the money on him. Say like, the money's out there in the field somewhere. You can go and get it. But the master said, take the money away from the servant. If you don't invest your life in the kingdom, the stuff that you have will be taken away from you. And this man is probably thinking, oh, man, I, I hope that's still there. I'm going to go and dig it up so I can reimburse myself. Someone say context. This is a little bit further back in Matthew, so maybe it's not context, but I, I thought this could be interesting. What if the parable of the hidden treasure from Matthew 13 was talking about someone who went and stole this man's treasure? Matthew 13, 44, again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys the field. 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all he had and he bought it. It doesn't say that this is connected to it at all, but the fact that the servant didn't have the money on him, yet that value was taken away from him, and then he probably went and searched for it, he would hope that it was still there where he had left it. So again, verse 28 uh, of uh, back in chapter 25. Then he ordered the money taken from the servant and give it to the one who had ten bags of silver. To those who use well what they are given, even more will be given, and they will have an abundance. How many people would like to have an abundance? The faithful did not say, sorry, not my job. I already have ten talents. No, he was given an extra one. But from those who... Do nothing, even what they have will be taken away. Now throw this useless servant into the outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Someone say context. context. We're going to go back up a little bit further. Verse 1, chapter 25, verse 1. We find the parable of the ten bridesmaids. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five of them were wise. The five who were foolish did not take enough olive oil for their lamps. But the other five were wise enough to take along extra oil. When the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. So I'm going to say all. This, this struck me that even the wise ones got drowsy. We are all going to go through times where we may get drowsy, and that's why it's so important that we bring extra oil. The gift in context. If, they're tr if Jesus is trying to tell the same story between the, the, the sheep and the goats that he separated, that he's also trying to tell in the gifts that got buried or invested. And it's the same story. He's trying to talk about the kingdom of heaven from three different perspectives. He's talking about the same thing. Then perhaps the gift that he's talking about is talking about the oil in our lamps. And what is that? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. 
So the thing that sustains us when we get tired is the Holy Spirit in our lives. They all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight, they were aroused by a shout, Look, the bridegroom is coming. Come out and meet him. And all the bridesmaids got up and prepared their lamps. Then the five foolish ones asked the others, Please give us some of your oil because our lamps are going out. Let me tell you this. You can't get to heaven in Grandma's Buick. You can't ride on Grandma's coattails. You've got to make sure there's gas in your own car. And the oil's been changed. But the others replied, we don't have enough for all of us. Go to the shop and buy some for yourself. God's been talking about this a lot lately. So often we ask God to do things for us that he told us to do for ourselves. Whose responsibility is it to make sure that there's oil in your lamp? Yes, not Pastor Stephen. Well, Elder Rick, Elder Jane, Elder Mark, it's yours. I can teach you about how the lamp works. You have to put the oil in the lamp yourself. But while they were gone to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. Then those who were ready went with him to the marriage feast, and the door was locked. And later... When the five other bridesmaids returned, they stood outside calling, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he called back, believe me, I do not know you. See, there's an honor in being the bride, but be a bride that is ready. I'd like to share a story that some some say is tradition, some say is myth, some just a romantic story, but I I like to believe it because it's It's fitting with Scripture. Whether it's true or not, enjoy this. It is said by some that Jewish weddings in biblical times, the arrival of the groom was a surprise. The bride and her bridal party were supposed to always be ready, and it was customary for one of the groom's party to go ahead of the bridegroom, leading the way to the bride's house, and he would shout, Behold, the bridegroom comes. This would be followed by the sounding of the shofar. The entire wedding processional would go through the streets of the city to the bride's house. The the groom would put down a deposit for his bride, 2 Corinthians 5.5, and it talks about that deposit being the Holy Spirit for Christ. And us. And after he's, when he does that, he goes off to build a house for the bridegroom, John 14, 3. While the groom is building the house, the bridegroom is supposed to make herself ready. But occasionally, the groom would become eager and hurried and want to cut corners because he was eager to get back to his bride even though the house might not be ready for the bride to, to, to come and join yet. So it wasn't the groom's decision on when the house was ready. It was the groom's father's decision on when the house was ready. Mark 13, 32 says that only the father knows the time or the hour. Then when the place is finished, the groom goes off to fetch his bride, who has been waiting all along. In Jewish tradition, this is generally done at night. Also, the tradition is that the best man would blow the shofar on a nearby hill only moments from the bride's chamber. This would give them just enough time for the bride and her attendants to not be caught in an immodest state, but also to awaken the village so they could start a week-long wedding party. The customs of supposed Jewish weddings is a beautiful parallel to how we are told the return of Christ, the bridegroom for his bride, us, the church. The big idea here is will we be ready? 
when I started thinking about the gifts and, oh, let's do a sermon about gifts. And I thought, oh, there's, there's gifts and there's talents in this parable. As I began to dig in, what I come to realize is that this story is not so much about the gift or the talents or the money as much as it is about being ready for the return of our king. It's not about what happened to the talent, whether it was invested and became more. It's more about what happened to the slave in the process. As he was being used, he went from being a slave to becoming celebrated. It's not about what happened to the oil. It's about the bride becoming wed. The process, the change that took place as we use what God gave us, his Holy Spirit, and it fills us up to overflowing continually. The idea of waiting for the return, the second coming, and the gifts that he's talking about here, it's about what God wants to do in us, in the process of of using us. The second coming is often so centered on judgment, yet it overlooks the joy of those who happen to be ready, and that's where we should be. We shouldn't be, if we're dreading the second coming, perhaps our oil isn't full. If all we see when we look at churches, rules and regulations, and we see an unjust God, we see pain and we see suffering, and we, this question was asked by someone recently, is I can't believe in a God who would allow suffering in the world. If God was real, then either he's not a good God or he doesn't exist. This is as absurd as if you've ever been in a car that broke down and determined that because this car broke down and I am now cold on the side of the road, that there is no designer of the car. No one designed this car because this car caused suffering. Therefore, this car does not exist. There is no car designer. Their car designers don't exist. Or this car designer is a bad car designer. That's one possible theory. But I would propose an alternate reason. This car is broken, and someone didn't change the oil. Our car is broken. This world is broken. It was designed perfect, yet we were put in the driver's seat and we did not change the oil. And so now there is suffering around us. And he wants us to fill up our oil regularly. See, these parables are about the kingdom and about being ready. Someone say context. Matthew chapter 24. Let's go back just a little bit further. Verse 4. I'm going to paraphrase some of this, but Matthew chapter 24, verse 4. Jesus told them that in the end days, many would be deceived. They would hear of wars, rumors of wars, threats of wars, but don't fear. Don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. It was as if there was the blowing of a shofar and you had a short amount of time. Nations will go to war. It will happen. It's not just going to be rumors. There, there will be bad things, and these have to happen before the king returns. So don't be afraid. Don't be surprised. Sometimes pushing against it is trying to push back against the return of the king. These things have to happen. There will be famine and earthquakes. Then, from bad to worse, you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated. You know, it's going to happen. Not not everyone's going to like us. (laughs) I'm sorry. Because you are followers. You are his followers. And in fact, many will turn away from me 
and betray and hate each other. There's a lot in the body of Christ who are turning away and hate each other. Wow, Stephen, this Christmas message got dark real fast. Dark, dark Christmas stories. Scrooge. The Christmas story. Christmas past, present, and future. I had a boss who once said, and he, and he, uh, he was Scottish, so I'll say this with a bit of an accent. He used to say, yesterday is history. Tomorrow is a mystery. All we have is today. It is a gift from God, and that's why we call it the present. For those of you who don't speak Scottish, yesterday is a mystery. Tomorrow is a mystery. <laughs> All we have is today. It is a gift from God, and that is why we call it the present. James 4.14, you do not know what will happen tomorrow. For what is your life? It is but mere vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. I tell you this, today do not leave without assurance of your eternal destination. You do not know what will happen tomorrow. For we're here one moment and gone the next. These are the last days. Again, in Matthew 24, picking up in verse 11, there will be many false prophets. Sin will be rampant. The love of many will grow cold. But, thank God for the buts. I like big buts like this one. <laughs> Because there's a whole bunch of darkness. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear. And then the end will come. With all that's going around us, in the world right now, it certainly appears that these are the last days. Whether they are or not, for many generations have thought before us, these are the last days. Here's one thing I can promise you. These are your only days. These are your last days. Live as if they are. Making sure your oil is full. preaching the gospel, sharing the good news. I'm about to close. In the parable of the servants, which one made the mistake of not having enough oil? The one who buried his treasure. I want to tell you today, God has given you treasure. He has hidden treasure inside of you. Some of you have taken it and hidden it in a closet somewhere. Some of you have actual physical talents that you've left hidden somewhere, sitting on a shelf or buried in a field. I, I don't know. Go dig it up. Dig it up. Or stir up the gifts, as Paul commends Timothy to do by the laying on of hands. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 6, says, For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light to, of the knowledge of God, of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. It's in our hearts to give. And then in verse 7, but we have this treasure in jars of clay. Where are those jars of clay? To show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. 
there was a word that God shared with me to share with someone earlier this week, and I shared it with them, but I feel like it's for more people. He says, do not let your gift sit on the shelf for too long. Do not keep it hidden in a closet or buried. Unwrap them and share them. Someone needs what you have. Let them see you. Let them hear you. Let them know you. I wrote this one down this morning. Therefore, remember from where you have fallen and repent. And do not do the, uh, sorry, and do the deeds that you did at first. Or else I am coming to you and I will remove the lampstand from its place unless you repent. Use it or lose it. You all bow your heads with me. Have you buried your gifts? Do you have hidden abilities that no one knows about? Do you have a talent sitting on a shelf, but you're afraid to use it? Fear not. Someone needs what you have. Have you let your oil go empty? Have you spent the time necessary in the secret place for him to see you and fill you with his Holy Spirit? Have you changed your oil lately? Have you neglected seeking him? He sees you in your secret place. He knows if you've been bad or good. Nothing is hidden from his sight. Today is a chance for you to fill your lamp. He has a free gift of grace and mercy, if you will receive it. He wants to make that deposit in your life, the Holy Spirit. He is that gift. He is that oil that wants to be put in your life. He wants to have us return to him. God, as we close this time together, I ask that you would just speak to our hearts and everyone who's hearing this message. That we would make sure to fill our oil. That we would be like the wise bride who is preparing. That we'd be like the wise servant who invested what you gave us and that you would trans continue that transformation in us from slave to one who is celebrated with you at the feast, a seat at your table as family. I do just want to give you an opportunity if you know that your oil has grown, gone, gone dry and you've not been spending time with the Lord, or perhaps you've never really accepted his invitation to be part of his family and made him Lord and save your life, that today you have that opportunity with us here as every head is bowed and eye is closed. If you want to commit your life to the Lord Jesus Christ for the first time, or recommit your life because you know you've not been following him the way you should. And you're afraid of what to my, my tomorrow might hold. That can all change right here, right now. You don't have to be afraid anymore. But if the, that is you and you're here in that, this room, with no one looking, just me, just raise your hand so I can see it. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. I see you. You're not alone. 
about three or four in this room. And I'm not going to embarrass you, but I do want you to know that the Bible tells us that as we declare him before man, he declares us before the king. And before you leave today, I want you to speak to someone who you know loves you, myself, one of the leaders. Let them know about that commitment that you've made just now so that they can pray with you. And if you don't, I'll chase you down. <laughs> okay? Because I love you. I love you. Amen? If you'd all stand with me. As we were um, praying, I, I had an image, uh, a picture, a mini movie, I guess, as you could say, that God gave me. And it was of a container, a container that God kept pushing away from a fire. And you kept coming and pushing it back to the fire. And it was starting to melt and oil started leaking out. And God kept saying no and kept pushing it away. And you kept pushing it back. And oil was starting to come out. And uh, I really feel like this is for somebody that God really wants you to be whole so that you can keep that oil inside of you. But something inside of you keeps pushing yourself back to what your old life used to be, close to the flame. But that is going to melt you. That is going to destroy you, and that is going to make that oil leak. And you need to stay full of that oil. So stop pushing yourself back to that old life of yours and allow God to push you away and stay whole with him and keep that oil inside. You know who you, who you are that I'm speaking to. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this day, Lord, that you've just encouraged us to serve you with all of our might, all of our strength, with everything you've given us, our talents, our treasure, but ultimately the, the gift that you gave us to invest was you. You are the gift. You are the talent. You are the pearl of great price that we would sell everything we have, get rid of everything we have, Lord. If all we had was you left over, you would be worth it. For the pain and the suffering, the challenges that we, we endure here on earth are just for a minute granule of sand in comparison to eternity. A small price to pay. What you have given us is worth so much. A hundred years worth of wages still was nothing compared to what you were worth. You were that gift. Your Holy Spirit was the deposit in us. Let us keep that filled, ready for your return. Using it, using everything you've given us to love others with our talents, with our finance. Lord, let us give freely just as you gave to us. Let us share freely without fear. Because you are our comforter, you are our provider, you are our, our support, you are everything. So I pray this week as we go, God, you would just prompt us to be the light, to be that candle stand. We don't want it to be removed, God. We want it to be used for you, to be the light from inside of our hearts, to shine out and let other people know and come close to you. In Jesus' name, amen.